Isn't the mayor of Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga, kid? <laughs> of Blue Bonnet Margarine and Tenderleaf Tea present the Fred Allen Show with Fred's guests George Jessel, Portland Hopper, Minerva Fias as Mrs. Nussbaum, Alan Reed as Falstaff Openshaw, the Tenderleaf Workshop Players, the DeMarco Sisters, and Al Goodman and his orchestra. And if you wonder who Senator Claghorn is, my name is Kenny Delmar. <laughs> January issue of Cosmopolitan Magazine, ladies and gentlemen, the so-called star of this program was selected as the Cosmopolite of the month. He's been called about everything else, but this month he's a Cosmopolite, and here he is, Fred Allen. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And Kenny, that story about me and Cosmopolitan, written by H. Allen Smith, turned out quite well, I thought. Yeah, you know, Fred, all of the magazines seem to be saluting people each month. They're always saluting. I've noticed that. Yeah, the Time magazine made President Truman the man of the year in January. You know, I hear Time is making Mayor LaGuardia the man of the month for February. It's a short month, I think. <laughs> The Hobo, the other magazines are still going full blast. The Hobo News is making Jack Benny the tramp of the month. <laughs> Pick is picking the punk of the month. And the Poultry Journal may be a... Well, Pork... You, uh, you want to cut in, Portland? Kenny and I are talking about magazines saluting different people. Has anyone in your family ever been honored by a magazine? Well, last year, the Police Gazette chose Mama as Miss Patrol Wagon for 1945. <laughs> Miss Patrol Wagon, huh? Is that... <laughs> I'll laugh at it. At least you got me. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a, a camp stool you have with you there? It's for Mama. She's standing in line. Standing in line for what? Mama doesn't know whether she's going to see the picture at the Roxy, get a ticket for Florida, or end up with a pair of nylons. She, uh, she doesn't know? Mama just saw a long line and got in it. Oh, well, that's... That's the trouble with the country today, Portland. Half of the people are standing in line to buy things... The other half is standing in line picketing. But aren't you... Uh, <laughs> just a mild demonstration, if any. Just a mild. We work it up as we go along. When Mr. Jessel arrives, big thing. But tell me, aren't you, Portland, <laughs> aren't you cold with those liquid stockings on? No, I always mix in a little antifreeze. Oh, with me. <laughs> There's only one trouble with liquid stockings in the winter. If it gets hot all of a sudden, you've got a shoe full of stocking. You never get that. Last week, Mama drank some liquid stockings by mistake. Drank some? Didn't it bother her? For two days, she hiccuped Bobby socks. Oh, <laughs> I know a man who drank a whole bottle of liquid stockings accidentally. Was he sick? No, but he had to swallow a garter to hold his stomach up. <laughs> after, that was the last time he saw Paris. After the... <laughs> and speaking of garters, when you've got to go to Allen's Alley, you've got to go. Remind me to give the writers more money. These women, they've got to go. These are my... <laughs> A question? You bet. You know, this past week, strikes closed most of the meatpacking plants throughout the country, shutting off the country's supply of meat. And so our question tonight is, if you have been unable to get your quota, how have you been coping with the meat shortage? Shall we go? As the electric fan said when somebody turned it on, I think I'll blow. <laughs> Well, here we are back in Allen's Alley, Portland. I guess the senator's home all right. His bullwhip is coiled up on the front step there. Somebody, I say, somebody now. Now, look, Senator. Claghorn's the name, Senator Claghorn. I know, I know your name. You're from the South. I'm a ding-dong daddy from Dallas. You're a... Yeah, on the radio, I'll never listen to thanks to the Yanks. Now, wait a minute. I'll speak up, son. What's on your mind? Well, if I only... Go ahead and talk, Well, all I'm trying to do a... Pal, the war's over, son, today. Loose lips ain't sinking shit. I'm just trying to get a word of you. Open your mouth, son. I've heard more conversation coming out of a knot hole. <laughs> Not 
You're winded, hey? <laughs> Only momentarily, sir. <laughs> Good. Now, I'll get in here. What about this meat strike? I, brought, I say, I brought it up in the house. Pay attention now, sir. <laughs> I don't need to get a chance to smirk. Hold up, son. You don't get it. You're from back country. Now, uh... <laughs> look, Senator, what about this meat problem? Well, the nation's capital will have plenty of meat for everybody. Well, where is Washington going to get this meat? Son, there's 130 million Americans. Yes. And today, every American is sending his beef to Washington. So long, <laughs> Well, the senator has a head like a pot roast. It brings back happy memories. Well, I hope Titus Moody is still up tonight. Now, let's see. Howdy, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Your exhaust is working well, Mr. Moody. You, uh, you feel all right? You look a little shaky. Boy, was I stiff last night. Drinking? No, no. Somebody put starch in my bath water. <laughs> you, uh, you have a bathtub in the house? No, no. Every Saturday night, I take a can of Dutch cleanser and lower myself down into the well. <laughs> in, this, in this cold weather? No. During the winter, I don't slop around in the well. Well, how, uh, how do you keep clean? Once a week, I go over myself with a racer and a wish broom. <laughs> well, how, uh, how about the meat shortage? Oh, that don't bother me, Norn. I'm a vegetarian. Well, haven't you ever tasted meat? Only once. That cured me. What happened? About 20 years ago, a city fella come around selling rabbits. And you bought one? Yeah. He gave me the rinky-dink. <laughs> The old R.D., hey? Yeah. Well, how do, you, how do you mean? He was dishonest. Dishonest, huh? He uh, looked like a rabbit, cooked like a rabbit, tasted like a rabbit. What makes you think it wasn't? Well, for two weeks after I ate the rabbit... Yes? Every time I smelled catnip, I turned a somersault. <laughs> Mr. Moody still has that hang-cat look, I must say. Oh, well, what will a knock at this door bring? No. Oh, Mrs. Nussbaum. You are expecting maybe Weinstein Churchill? Uh. <laughs> Tell me, uh, Mrs. N., has the meat strike bothered you? I am in a dilemma. Uh. <laughs> dilemma? There is such a word. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yes, dilemma is a word. You, uh, you might have read it someplace. I'm only reading broken English. Oh. As I am speaking, so I am reading. Oh, fine. Why be deceitful? Who am I fooling? Well, I see your point, Jack. Yes. I agree with you thoroughly. But what about the meat shortage? Confidentially, we are having well in hand the situation. You, uh, you had some old meat stored up, did you? Oh, no. My husband, Pierre, is buying a goat. A second-hand billy. A second-hand A used goat. A, li a live goat? The first night, we are locking him in the clothes closet. I see. During the night, the goat is eating the backs off of three of Pierre's union suits. Oh, gosh. The next day, the goat Pierre is killing, and we are having for dinner. Well, after eating the backs off three union suits, how did the goat taste? Like flapjacks, but delicious. Oh, I... <laughs> And that brings us to the little vine covered shanty at the end of the alley. A knock here should certainly start something. Shout the star, scream adjectives flowery. Paul Staff is here, the bard of the Bowery. Well, 
Something tells me that you have new poems for us tonight. Oh, indubitably. Have you heard when they pinched Uncle Charlie, his excuse was the honey? He claimed he was in the bank just feeling the money. <laughs> no, I haven't heard that. Or, uh, the jukebox was playing I'm Confessing as she lured me into the delicatessen. No. <laughs> no. How about this? Mother, please don't point father at me. He may be loaded again. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Please. Tonight we are simply discussing the meat strike. Precisely why I am here. I would bark some doggerel. Well, what is your meat poem called? Joy reigns supreme in the stockyards. Uh huh. How does it go? Joy reigns supreme in the stockyards. When the meat strike was called through the nation, the cattle doomed to die in their pens gave the news tremendous ovation. A little ram frisked with his ewe. A Holstein kissed one of the steers. A big shaggy heifer danced round like a zephyr. A brindle cow mooed out three cheers. Yes, joy reigned supreme in the stockyards. Chicago's mayor seen such a sight. A jubilant ox jumped up on a box and yelled, Ah, oh, there's good news tonight. <laughs> and as Bob opened your scouts to the wing... We turn to our melodic, Mrs. The Five DeMarco Sisters. Tonight, accompanied by Al Goodman and his poor man's Philharmonic, the DeMarco sing Hubba Hubba from the new picture, Doll Fate. <laughs> helpful hint about the family table. Whatever concerns the family table is important to us all, and here's a good example. I'll bet you can all bake good biscuits, ladies. Tender, light, fluffy, mouth-melting. And here's a spread just made to go on these super biscuits of yours. Blue Bonnet Margarine. For Blue Bonnet gives you flavor, nutrition, economy. All three. Blue Bonnet has a delicious flavor. Fresh, delicate, country sweet. You'll say no spread at any price ever gave you more delicious eating. Blue Bonnet gives you proved nutrition, too. It's rich in food energy, rich in vitamin A. As for economy, you'll find Blue Bonnet saves you real money. Why, it costs so little, you can spread it on twice as thick. And remember, Blue Bonnet margarine is a product of the nature of Fleischmann's yeast, a name that down through the years has always stood for quality. Be sure to ask your grocer for Blue Bonnet tomorrow. Remember the letters F-N-E for flavor, nutrition, economy. Blue Bonnet margarine gives all three... Flavor, nutrition, economy. That was just a few flakes from Let It Snow, played by Maestro Al Goodman <laughs> and his racing form rhythm boys. Okay, um, yes, Portland. Uh, shall I call these letters here? Uh, if you will, please. Those are the last of the Jack Benny contest letters. I've been up three nights reading them. You know, I'm one of the judges. And uh, speaking of letters, Portland reminds me, could you get your pencil, please? I want to dictate a letter. I'm all ready. You're all ready? We'll take this down. Mr. George Jessel, 20th Century Fox Studios. Dear Mr. Jessel, you are a rap, capital R. Signed, yours sincerely, Fred Allen. Get that off instantly. Well, I thought you and Georgie were friends. I'll never speak to Jessel again unless I happen to get a wrong number. 
gosh, what happened? Well, last week, Mr. Jessel was here in New York. You know, he's a big producer for 20th Century Fox Pictures now, and I received a note saying that Mr. Jessel wanted to see me. So I got all dressed up, got my cane out of Simpsons, and started for Mr. Jessel's office. <laughs> When I arrived at the 20th Century Fox building, I found Mr. Jessel's office, a big nylon door, and I knocked on the door. Come in, come in. Georgie Jessel. Well, Georgie. Hey, excuse me, Fred. I'm on the phone at the moment. Hello, Lidget Drugstore. This is Georgie Jessel speaking. I want six boxcars of Bromo Self to send out to my studio in Hollywood right away. Okay. Georgie, six boxcars of Bromo Seltzer? Yeah, it's for my new picture, Fred. Bromo Seltzer? Yes, I'm making a sequel to The Lost Weekend. It's called Saratoga Drunk. Oh. <laughs> Last son, what's the matter there? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Saratoga drunk sounds like a great picture. Well, it's a new idea, Fred. An elephant drinks too much and sees 200 pink sabus. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Hollywood could you possibly pick up 200 pink sabus. And Hollywood, I must say, has surely changed you, Georgie. Those clothes you have on. Oh, well, this is my working suit, Fred. The uh, <laughs> shirt happens to have a pink dicky, but nobody knows. No. A mink, it's mink, isn't it? It yeah. isn't pink, it's a mink dicky. Right. And it goes well. That's right. It goes well. <laughs> it says... <laughs> it says pink here, but I'll say mink anyway. <laughs> It goes well with that fur mandarin coat you have on. Yes, this is genuine grizzly bear. Instead of the belt in the back, it has a big paw hanging down. Oh, okay. it's paw is a paw. I a big paw. But as you are, you Hollywood tycoons with your paws hanging down on the back, I suppose you're still living in that house out in Beverly Hills that looks like the Rose Bowl with Phoenician blinds. Oh, you... You should see it now, Fred. I've had all the grass dyed white. You have white grass? Yeah. Why? Well, when the newsboy throws the paper on the lawn, the color shouldn't clash. You see? <laughs> That's Fred, right. I've got lavender trees and a pink hedge and a plaid sidewalk. Well, say, this riot of colors must be causing plenty of comment. What comment? Nobody even notices it. In Hollywood, who takes off the dark glasses? Oh, I... <laughs> Georgie... I wonder what would happen if one day everybody in Hollywood took off their dark glasses and all of the people got a good look at each other. This is a horrible thought, Fred. <laughs> but tell me about your house, George. You have a swimming pool, of course. I have the biggest pool in Hollywood. Well, how big is it? Well, when you stand on one side of the pool, yes. from the other side you can hear voices yelling. When are they going to send us home? That's how big the pool is. Well, you're a great success, Georgie. I saw your last picture of the Dolly Sisters. It was swell. Well, what I did for the Dolly Sisters, Fred, I can do for you. As a matter of fact, that's why I sent for you. Really? I want to produce a story of your life. The story of my life? Yes. It'll be bigger than Daryl Zanuck's uh, Leave It a Heaven. I had to get it in. They but, made but me. Georgie, I know they have a big whip out there when you leave on the plane. But, Georgie, what actor could you possibly get to play my life? Don Amici? No, Amici's tied up. Really? You know, with the telephone situation, he's sorry he started the whole thing off. <laughs> No, there's only one man to play your life, Fred, and that is you. You mean that I will be the star? Star? Why, it's your life. Everybody else in the picture is just the stooge. I'm the whole picture. Yes, Fred, there's just one little thing. Yes, George. Well, yes. now, you know how Alfred Hitchcock always sneaks into some scene in every picture that he directs. Yes, you always see Mr. Hitchcock in the crowd trying to get into the automat with his nickel out or something. That's right, that's right. Now, do you mind if I do just a little bit like that in your picture? A little bit? Of course not, George. You know, they'll just see the back of my head maybe in a barber's chair or... Maybe I'll run past the camera with a push cart fast. Nobody will see. <laughs> Suppose we just call that a producer's whim. Well, know. anything you say, George. You know, what is this story like? All right, the picture opens with the 20th Century Fox signature music. <laughs> George Jessel presents The Life of Fred Allen, starring Fred Allen. <laughs> That's wonderful, Georgie. Now what happened? Now, as the story opens, Fred, you are four years old. Now, wait a minute. Well, how can I play a four-year-old kid? Fred, our makeup man can do anything, really. But I'm six feet tall. How can I be a kid? You play the whole first scene on your knees. <laughs> on my 
knees. Yeah, we'll glue some shoes on your kneecaps. Uh, nobody will know the difference. Well, if I walk on my knees, my arms will be dragging on the ground. <laughs> All right, so we'll double up your arms, stick little false fingers on your elbows. Well, after I'm made up, what do I do in the picture? Well, the story opens in Illinois. Now, you see, now, Fred... Wait, wait a minute, Georgie. I was born in Boston, in Massachusetts. I know that, Fred, but we have an old Illinois set left on the lot from another picture. <laughs> What picture? Home in Indiana. <laughs> Home in Indiana. Now, Fred, if you're going to question no, every little... No, no, you're the producer, Georgie. Go all on. right, all right. The picture opens. It is morning. To little Freddie Allen, starting out in life, the world is a glorious adventure. He is on his way to school, happy, carefree. But see, he stops. The little tyke is worried. Is he late for school? By the side of the road, he sees a gaunt, lean man chopping logs. Hurrying over to this woodchopper, little Freddy says, Sir, what is the time? The time, my son? It's time for every American to stop and ponder. Our country is at the crossroads. Sit down on this log, son. I'm only a rail splitter myself. My name is Lincoln. Abe Lincoln. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> I wrote a talk. I'm going to make My boy, I'd like you to hear it. And tell me what you think of it. Georgie. Sit down on the log and I'll read it for you. Look, now, wait. Four score and seven years ago, Georgie. our fathers brought forth this minute. continent a new nation. Now, look. Conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait. Stop the music. Stop the music. Now, what's the matter, Fred? What's wrong? What's wrong? Yeah. This is supposed to be the life of Fred Allen. It starts out the whole thing is Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Fred, who is sitting there on the log listening to Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> you. Now, the way the camera said, whose face is the audience? See, yours. And I want to tell you something. You were great. I was great, yes. <laughs> I didn't do anything. You don't understand pictures, Fred. Well, look, I... Uh, now, do you realize what America owes you? If you hadn't let Lincoln try out his Gettysburg address on you, he might have gotten discouraged and torn up the whole business. <laughs> well, I can't you hear people saying, why, well, if it wasn't for little Fred Allen, the Civil War might still be going on. Now, but George, <laughs> if I was four years old when Lincoln was a rail splitter... Today, I'd be 125 years of age. Who listens? Who cares about such things in fiction? Maybe a couple of history professors who are sitting in the balcony, that's all. <laughs> or Joel Copperman. Now, pay no attention to it. Just wait till you see this next thing. Am I in it? Am I in it? He says, am I in it? It's, it's all you, Fred. You're a young man, but you have taken to drink. Drink? Yes, you're living in Albany. It's apple country, and you're a cider fiend. I'm full of cider, huh? Yeah, full of cider. Now you have to make a decision. What will it be? Cider or success? As the scene opens, it's the waterfront. The camera's on a jug of cider in your hand. It's clutching that jug. Will young Fred Allen be picked up by Cider Anonymous? See, he awakens, still in a stupor. He staggers up to a man standing next to a boat on the dock. Allen speaks. Mister, what day is this? What day is this, young man? Today is a new day in American navigation. My name is Fulton, Robert Fulton. Now, wait a minute. In a few minutes, I'm testing my steamboat to Claremont. That's why this crowd is here right now. <laughs> Folks, in a minute you'll see a miracle, a boat driven by steam. <laughs> Fulton's father. All right. All right, laugh, you fool. But I'll show you. I told you my boat would go today. I'll steam down the river. Steam down, Mr. Fulton. Steam down. All right, cast those ropes to stop the engine. Watch my steam. <laughs> years old, and so far in my whole life, I have spoken twice. <laughs> I have asked two questions. Fred, you don't understand pictures. I don't understand pictures, but Georgie, if I only had some lines to say, at least I could pull the whistle on the boat. <laughs> Stop, pull the whistle on the boat? But what is Robert Fulton? Look, you don't get the significance, Fred. I did something again? Certainly you did. You see, when Fulton faced that mob of scoffers, he was about to give up. But he saw in the crowd one face that encouraged him. The camera closes in. This face that he saw, this is yours. You mean that I'm there on the dock? Why, if it wasn't for you today, there would be no Fulton fish market. <laughs> There'd 
be no steam. There'd be no precious bass. No steam... Co- Tailors would be pressing pants by hand. But, Georgie... Stop complaining, will you? Because the rest of the picture is all you. Well, it's about time. Now, what happens now? Next scene opens down south. Uh-huh. You started a new life, Greg. You got a job. Good. You're good. on your way to rent a room. And good. as we fade in, you're walking up the stairs of an old southern man. Sounds good. Yes, Red Allen has made a comeback. He has work. His eyes are bright. The world is before him. He knocks on the door of the old southern mansion. A kindly old man with snow-white hair opens the door. Pardon me, sir. Have you a room to rent? Come right in, son, and set yourself down. My name is Foster, Stephen Foster. Now, wait a minute. (laughs) I wrote a new song this morning, and I want to sing it for you. Now, look, George. Way down upon the Swanee River, is the last draw. All right, now what? What is this picture? The life of Fred Allen or a George Jessel cavalcade? What do you mean? <laughs> now, stop stalling, Jessel. You were just going to put the back of your head in my picture. Now, first the picture, you're Lincoln, then you're Fulton, now you're Stephen Foster. When do you show up as Florence Nightingale? <laughs> Who showed you the script? Never mind, the picture end? How does the picture end? Every picture fades out with a kiss. Don't tell me you're a contortionist and you kiss yourself. <laughs> now listen, Fred Allen, I'm the producer. Now listen, George Jessel, I'm the star. If this is the life of Fred Allen, I won't stand All for All right, it. I'll tell you what to do. Drop dead and I'll make your life a two-wheel short. Fine, well, I'll do that. Make an appointment. <laughs> Kenny, with a short talk on the American woman. Ever since Priscilla married John Alden, the fame of the American woman has been growing. In spirit, beauty, and ability, she leads the world today. At home, above all, she is practical, especially about shopping. That's why she buys tenderleaf tea balls in preference to all others. They are the largest selling tea balls in America because they are better in every way. In daily use, with meals or between, they provide finer, richer, more delicious tea. It's famous for flavor tenderleaf brand tea in tasteless filter paper packets. The crisp white filter paper is pleasant to see, inviting, and dainty to handle. It's entirely insoluble, so your tea is filtered as it's being made. No specks in your cup, nothing but tea goodness, and a world of quick comfort. When you want quick comfort, get it this easy way. One tenderleaf tea ball in your cup with boiling water added. Yes, for every good practical reason, ask your grocer for tenderleaf brand tea ball. Thank you, Kenny. And now, before we stack up the tenderleaf tea and put the blue bonnet margarine back in the ice box, I want to thank Georgie Jessel for joining us tonight. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, next Sunday night, the Fred Allen Show brings you comedy. <laughs> Drama. But, Henrietta, you're too young to die. Oh, yeah, hand me that peroxide. <laughs> And our guest will be... That writer of hit tunes, Johnny Mercer. Thank you. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.